Hey, Peter. Hey, Adam. Do you know what your job is? My job? Like, me personally? If you had a job, what would it be? Um, Being a part of the rhythm section? I hope. No. That's <laughs> incorrect. I'll tell you about it. Okay. I'm Adam Ennis. And I'm Peter Martin. And you're listening to the You'll Hear It podcast. Music advice coming at you. Coming at you today, sponsored by Open Studio. Go to openstudiojazz.com for all your jazz lesson needs. Peter, yes, it's, sir. it's another podcast day. I'm so excited about today. This is actually a bit of a user request, yes. the topic for today's podcast, which is the most important job uh, of a rhythm section. And I'm 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 super excited to dig into this with you. Uh, we were having a conversation last week on our YouTube live. You'll hear it, which by the way, you should check out if you're listening to this. Yes, uh, where we have a little conversation before and after, and someone said, "Yes, talk about that." So we're going to talk about it. Yes. Now I'm just looking at the title that uh, you came up with. The most important job of a rhythm section is there specific clarity that we should be uh, focusing in on that you didn't say the most important jobs. A rhythm section? Are we yeah. going singular? There's one, Are we going dogmatic? We're going the most, really, the singular most important job. Now, this is oh. definitely going to be up for debate. <laughs> Actually, full disclosure? Full disclosure, <laughs> it's even up for debate what a rhythm section is. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, I, I threw that wrinkle at the last minute here. But, but I think for the purposes of this episode, we will define a rhythm section as anybody who's accompanying a soloist. So if someone's singing a song and you're playing piano, you're the rhythm section. Hold on a second. I'm calling Christian McBride. Oh, boy. To... I knew I shouldn't have used his Hey, photo. Christian, what's up? <laughs> McBreezy, it's Peter. Uh, I'm here with Adam Manis, and oh, he's saying that the rhythm section is beyond just the bass. Just Oh, you got to go. All right, peace. Uh, well, All right. <laughs> <laughs> you have to define it one way. And I, right. I, well, what I wanted to do, why I'm defining it so loosely as it could be pianists or vibes or whatever as people who are accompanying is because I do have some some examples here of piano accompanying a voice, solo piano. And I think you do have the same responsibilities that a traditional bass drum guitar, bass drum piano guitar rhythm section has. Yeah, you absolutely. Know? Absolutely. So we've talked about this a little bit before. So the, what is the most important job? Do you even know? I don't know because you didn't you you remember the our new format is like I'm not going to tell you anything about I mean I know what I think it is. What do you think it is? Um well now see I want to hear from you first. Okay. You go first. I'll I'll, I'll tell you what. It is. <laughs> so the most important job for a rhythm section is to mark the form. Is to set up the form for the listener and for the other musicians they're playing with. Survey says Correct. <laughs> right. But, so we could we could definitely caveat this by saying, yes, keeping time and, and playing the right chords. is. But, you know, in general, all of that kind of falls under the category of form, of yeah. keeping the form. And it really is our responsibility in the rhythm section to accompany in a way that makes the form very, very clear. Yes. And I love this. I, I love this. And I'm glad that you picked that. and would wholeheartedly agree because I also feel like um, – playing with good time, playing in tune, like all the different things you could say are the most important thing. Those are actually just baseline, um, sorry, no no pun intended there, <laughs> um, foundational, you know, almost just professionalism yeah. that we need to have really on any instrument, but in terms of looking at the rhythm section, you know, well, the most important thing is to play together. No, that's not, like that's a given, if right. anything. Yeah. So when we get into form and stuff, like you could have all of your basic skills, foundational skills, fundamental skills, if you will, together, but still not be able to uh, really mark, and or I think bigger than even just mark, or inclusive within that world of marking the form, organizing the form, which sometimes is not marking the form, you know, but being in control of That's that, right. like really looking at it from an architectural standpoint, right. it's just from a like, I'm in this measure, I'm going from here to here. And so when you start to look at it with a little bit bigger picture, a lot of these other things that are important become smaller though. They're just like given. And I love that from a mindset thing to be like, no, you're coming. It's like, you're coming to the basketball game. What's the most important thing? Don't double dribble. No, you shouldn't even be on the court right. if you're worried about double dribbling. Right. So we, we're going to build this. I love that. So we're going to the basketball analogy. So we're going to we're going to build this up from the ground up in the way that you would build anything up. 
uh, marking the form is a craft and then it's an art. So just like if we were to like talk about voicing chords, right? There's a craft to that where yeah. you learn about the technical aspects of voicing chords. But then once you kind of understand the craft, the art begins because yes. then you make choices yep. and your choices are the art. So we'll build it up here uh, with the craft and then we'll kind of like lean into the art a little bit. Mm. And so can we unpack those? We can unpack those. Nice. I want to kick off here with it's this is actually kind of a unique example um, of this is this is from our uh, our course Fundamentals of Jazz Drumming here at Open Studio. By the way, all the examples I'm going to play today are from open studio courses i started to make a spotify playlist from like <laughs> classic albums yeah and then i realized like wait a minute i have like <laughs> all of this uh material here at open studio that we've made over the years and it's really amazing and we get to break it down kind of uh inherently because they're they're instructing in a lot of cases how to do this so That's great we're going to kick it off with gregory hutchinson from his amazing course fundamentals of jazz drumming and he is, uh, this is the, the name of the lesson is the art of comping. Mm. And he's going to play evidence. And he's actually going to kind of play the tune, but you'll see he marks the form for himself. And I thought this was the highest level. Yeah. And Hutch is one of the great accompanists of all time. Yeah. He's one yeah. of the great drummers ever. He's one of the great uh, rhythm section players that's ever lived. Rhythm section personified in, in a he lot is. of ways. I've, I don't think I've ever actually heard anybody. Team player clearly mark the form in such a beautifully artistic way than Gregory Hutchinson and he demonstrates it here effortlessly by himself on the drums now before you start let me just say one thing you're absolutely right and I'm having played with him for years he's so lovingly um you know extend ex extends his understanding to you of the form up until a point it becomes unloving when you start messing up the form or going against him, well, he's, then, then the love is gone. <laughs> right. And that's because I think you can tell he is in service of the form. Exactly. And so anything that takes the, away from and, that, and bigger he's than not that, the music. The music. Yeah. Exactly. He is not down if you're messing with the music. No. Yeah. Exactly. So let's check him out. And you're going to hear, if you know the tune evidence, you're going to hear the tune in what he's playing. Yeah. Um, but listen to how he marks himself and lets himself know where he is. It's, it's remarkable. Check this out. Solo drums. Here's the bridge. You hear that? the next chorus crystal clear yeah still the melody is there what i mean yeah never an opportunity to lose your place because hutch is gently cradling you down yeah in the form yeah and that's solo drums but that's what a great accompanist can do yeah. is they don't need you know you don't even need the other instruments like it's so clear it's just so internalized yeah i think in hutch that uh it just comes through effortlessly and there's like a connection he's so connected with the form that it extends even in playing solo drums to being connected with the bass, mm. the piano, the horns, the melody, even when they're not playing, it's like it actually, it's like an optical illusion, an oral illusion that it's brought in something, whether, I mean, certainly if you know the song and then you feel like you kind of, he sets you right within that form so that you start singing it yourself in your head. But even if you don't know it, he's giving you the lay of the land, if you will, so that, Absolutely. you know, and then the setups going into the chorus, like the second chorus, how it was going into the third, right? What we heard at the end compared to the first, 
you know, was a longer kind of setup, but it was like he was placing you within the next part of the form before you even got there, before you even knew you needed to be there. That's right. Yeah. yeah. No, he, he's he's foreshadowing. Yeah. Like he's casting a head, he's shadow casting, like yeah. a, like an expert fly fish or something. <laughs> you know what I mean? But he's really there's a lot of artistry there. Yeah. Uh, let's talk a little bit now with our next example, kind of about building up the craft, right? Yeah. So building up the craft usually means kind of putting on some restrictions and thinking about things in a very kind of like cookie cutter kind of way before yeah. you could start making decisions. I found a really good example of uh, a very clear cut marking of the form in the way that we might traditionally think about it. Mm -hmm. It's on a blues form. This is a fast blues from Jeffrey Keezer's advanced jazz piano course. Okay. This is Ben Williams on bass. And Billy Kilson on the drums. Mm. Not a bad rhythm section. Not bad at all. Behind Jeffrey Keezer. And I have here some double bars that mark each new chorus. Okay. Uh, and so I'll kind of mark those here audibly as we go. And uh, you can follow along and hear how Ben sets up melodically what's happening uh, each new chorus. And Billy, for certainly, for certainly, <laughs> for certain, for sure, for sure, for sure, <laughs> sets up uh, the new the new chorus each time. This is kind of like, I think, uh, a, a perfect example of a, of a very base, high level basic way to do this, right? And it's Hold an on. easy way to hear. So every 12 bars, you can hear these two masters reset the form. Let's check it out. Okay. Just skating through here, right? Check it out. Here we go. A little flourish. It was on four too, right? Yeah. Again, just a little flourish. Oof. Bam. Each time it's coming around here, right? Each time that chorus comes around. One, two, one. Bam. Now notice how Billy Kilson is going to set up Keezer's phrases. Watch. Ah. Uh. Uh. Bam. And you know, what Jeffrey Keezer is doing here is not basic. No. This is not an Oscar Peterson blues, right? It's but the rhythm, if we look at Kilson and Ben Williams, whew, like they enable all this to happen, basically, because of what they played the first couple of choruses. That was the signal to Keezer, like, oh. Uh. Killing. Yeah. So you can hear there just a real clear cut example of R12 of the blues, but it was most of them. Uh, Billy Kilson is setting up some kind of big spike of like, bam, bam, bam. Yeah. You know, and it and then you can hear within that setting up the phrases. So, you know, we were talking with some people before this about what is this? And, and in the most advanced level, this really is just conversational. Right. So we can think about this as the craft of, yes, I should set up every four bar phrase or every 12 bar or every chorus or every phrase of the melody or of the tune. Yeah. But then once you get going in it and the artistry kicks in and you start making choices, you're interacting and you're having a conversation with the soloist setting up phrase by phrase. And that's really, you know, I want you to think about if as we're listening to the rest of these examples, uh, like how conversational that gets. There's mm. really no formula to it. The only formula is you have to listen so deeply and know where you are in the form. That's it. Right, 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 right. Yeah, and I was just thinking too uh, that um, the way that the rhythm section, if we look at the bass and the drums as being the one, uh, as the rhythm section in this case, their mastery of the form so early on in that performance is what really set things up in a way for Keezer to know that he could play with the form. Like it's almost like you're giving you're giving the soloist a license there. It's like, oh, mm. 
by the way that you play. You're communicating that. And so I love, like, a lot of times that happens. I'm in situations, and I don't even think about it. So I take it for granted in a way, but I don't take it for granted because it's just it's just so important, so important. So the next way I want to talk about is there's there's a couple things that are going to happen in this, in, in this next example. And this is great because I get to embarrass you now, too. So yeah. this is from one of your courses with your friends, Gregory Hutchinson and Ruben Rogers. This is from Rhythm Section Workout, uh, the second Rhythm Section course you did with Ruben and Hutch. and. Okay. Uh, this is your arrangement of in a mellow tone, and this is going to introduce the idea of the arrangement that you come up with. And this is this is a bit of a, a worked out arrangement for you, but there's nothing like there's no like crazy crazy reharms in this. It's fairly straight down the middle as far as it's just great ideas, right, of setting it up. But you have great ways here within the arrangement yeah. of setting up the form. Okay, that's part of arranging. Like you wouldn't put these hits in in the middle of bar three after like in the middle of the melody. So notice where. Peter's put this hits. Now, the first solo in this performance is Rubens. And so we're going to listen to you now become part of the rhythm section. Hold on. I, I, I put a bass solo first. I didn't set things up all that great then. Hold I know. On. I know. Maybe <laughs> not your best work. Maybe not your best work. No, but uh, so what I want, want to listen to with this one is both the arrangement and how you set up uh, the the head and, and the form in general with the arrangement but also then how you're setting up Ruben during his solo. You do some really interesting things here uh, and it's very crystal clear to me. So let's check it out. This is In a Mellow Tone, Peter right. Martin Trio. Right? Are we in three? Are we in five? No, I don't know. I, I always get lost. <laughs> no one does. <laughs> but check out how you set this up. Brilliant here, Peter, really. Uh. I'm sorry, was that clear to everybody? <laughs> was that not clear? So no, it's actually very nebulous leading up to that. And then when you hit that, that six chord going into the head, it's very clear. Let's hear that again, just that transition. Your hits here, setting up the form. Uh. This is all part of it. This is part of marking the form. And some people sit, might say with this, like, I mean, come on. That, let's we gotta hear that again. Some people might say, uh, and and I can see already some people saying, well, isn't keeping time the most important part? Keeping time is the most important part. This is keeping time. This is keeping the form, which is keeping the time of the actual song. Mm -hmm. This is what it's about. Yeah. It's not about just having good time. People can have good time and not sound like good musicians. Let's hear that transition going into that second A again. All setting up the melody. Look at that. Look at Hutch just like, bam, here's the four. Yeah. Check it out. We're going to set up the solo. what Hutch played on the one there, very subtle, but that kind of reset things in a way that gave Ruben the ability to kind of just play a nice idea without having to be like, okay, I'm starting my solo. It's a springboard. Let's yeah. hear that again. Listen to what Gregory Hutchinson does here on the one of the form. One, two, three. It's, it's a little, little symbol, a little, 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 little brush on a symbol. Here's where we are, everybody. Yeah. It's part of it. And yeah. really what he does, you know, even more so, like, like he has such a great swing, you know, just a, a, what would you call it? Just a basic brush swing groove. Yeah. 
that as soon as he goes into that, that kind of sets up the form in a way that's so, I mean, forget about just keeping time and swing and groove and all. He, that, he's like, shoosh, two beats into it, he's already done that. It's telling you exactly where you're going to go here yeah. for the next, and you feel safe and like wrapped up in a little yeah. form blanket. And that's, exactly. As a soloist, isn't that what you want? You exactly. want to be like, okay, we are in a good place. You don't know how many times over the years, and now that I'm thinking about it, I'll look over at Greg like, and he'll... Like hit that symbol on the one where it's yeah. kind of like mm, just in case, because yeah. <laughs> you know if things are loose enough, it might be four way. If somebody's like, just a little reminder, okay, let's and go. And there's nothing. There's no worse feeling as a soloist than <laughs> you wondering, wait, does the drummer not know where the one is? <laughs> oh no, this is gonna be bad. No, no. <laughs> this is not gonna be good. Let's hear it again. All right, now I want I want everybody to pay attention to what you're doing here, Peter, and how you oh, set up the form. <laughs> no, I, listen I to hope what I did. Something good. Listen we'll to see. how Peter comps crystal clearly for Ruben and you'll never lose the form with with how you're setting it up Even your even your voicing choices are hinting at the melody. And you're also responding, I can hear you responding to what Ruben's doing. Very clear, now we're here. That little thing right there, right there at the end. That is not something you probably thought about, but you just responded, Oh, you're done? Here's what I'm gonna do, right? You're gonna let the audience know, bass solo over, it's time for the money. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, and yeah, and I think too, you know, actually I, I don't know that I'm necessarily thinking about this on a actual phrase basis, but Overall, I do try to accompany in a way, and I guess this kind of fits in with with where you're placing as a pianist within the form as you comp, especially during a bass solo where you don't have that sort of harmonic foundation of the rhythm section. But thinking about comping in a way that's not like, sometimes I know what Ruben's probably gonna play or he'll place in such a logical way. But you know, like, so I'll try to find something to play that fits with that and is interesting, but segues in terms of the form into the piano solo. So it's not like, right up to the fourth beat of the last bar, I'm accompanying him only, and then I become a soloist. Because I think that the listener, the music, it needs to breathe, it needs to feel like there's a transitional period. And that doesn't always happen right at that bar line. I'm a bar line robot, you know? Yeah, yeah. And so I don't always hit it, but that, that, I think that was an example where we did pretty good. I'm almost playing against him a little and starting to get in his way, but I'm, but I'm playing in a way that still allows the end of his thing. So you get that fun kind of overlapping. Absolutely. And then Greg, really, from a rhythm standpoint, is the one who enables that, even to be able to have that kind of a dialogue between us. Exactly, because then you can be free with the phrasing. You can be a little more free with the time, even, knowing that that blanket is there and that the form is, is yeah. going to be with it. You know, the more I think about this, this sort of relationship between the time, playing time, and the form, they really are intimately connected you can't have yeah. one without the other form is really just the long form of the time yeah you break down the time to it to quarter notes eighth notes 16th notes yeah. or a chorus that's yeah. all just the length of time and so how we approach those periods of time i think are the important things for any rhythm section player yeah and i think too like what you start to see like how the the sort of next level of this is having such an intuitive understanding of the form and i know we keep coming back to the drums mm. but that's ultimately i think they in this style of playing the drummer in a lot of ways has the most potential control over interacting with others in the rhythm section and the soloist and, and whoever else is playing for sure and kind of being the architect of the delineation of the form you know it's everybody's responsibility to fit into the form and you could argue that it's, that's the base in a way because they have actual harmonic input into like where the root is and things like that but in terms of like especially you come to a bass solo situation where they're stepping out front. So for how do you make it not feel like the rug's 
falling out from under you. It's not the pianist, actually. It's the drums, I think, in this. Like, the more that we can, as piano players, yeah, we're not going to be playing as loud as if it's the middle of a trumpet solo. It's a bass solo. But the interactivity, like, how do you get to that point where you can interact and comp behind and have the dialogue the same way you would with the vocalist, but it's a bass solo? That's a drummer that really understands the role of the rhythm section, their role in just very completely as you say, like putting that blanket of the form on us, you know, and yeah. then giving that freedom within that. Let's talk now about uh, the role of of pitch in keeping the form, right? Yeah. We talked a little bit about it with your choice of chords and voicings for Ruben Solo and how you kind of really, you kept the melody was audible in your voicings. Uh, but we have a chorus here from, uh, this is from Ruben and Ulysses Owens Jr. Card the, called The Art of Swing. Mm. And they play a little bit here of Someday My Prince Will Come in three. And I want you to just pay attention to how Ruben, very, I mean, he's such a master at this, at just simply setting up your ear's expectation for where it's going to go melodically. Mm -hmm. So we'll just hear drums and bass here, but listen to how Ruben stays simple. So even that, even just setting up there, we're gonna we're gonna start the form. We're gonna start the melody. Yeah. You know, he's just doing, you know, the pedal at front, and then he does two dotted half notes, right? Just you know, essentially one one note per bar. And then right before he does that. Mm. Bam. You just landed so gently, like yeah. a 747. Yes. just going in there that little phrase there everything leading in with leading tones half steps from above let's listen to that again and what you list is can we just pl play that same part back let's just focus sure. a little bit on you because he does hi-hat on two each time and then there's one where he kind of opens up the hi-hat yeah and the same thing with the form and that's an important place in terms of like they're hearing the melody uh, even though it's not there, but in terms of the harmonic movement, it fits very well. Here. Ah. That's Just that so little nice. thing, you know. But, no, but it sets up the end of that phrase. Even Ruben's going to hint at the melody here, yeah. you know? The bass player can do it. There's no question where the chord changes are. Right. You know what I mean? He's not playing ninths and sharp elevenths in, you know, hitting these upper extensions. Right. He's really letting his listener know, here's what's happening next. He's yeah. foreshadowing what's going to happen. And then, like all good artists, he might pull the rug out from from under you occasionally. Yeah. But that's just for your amusement. That's you know right. I mean? It's that's just right. so, great. Right, right, so right. great. That's right. And I think, too, it's like he. you can see when he gets going on kind of a pattern of hitting the roots on the one the same way with like with Ulysses and King like really hitting that hi-hat it's all about setting up patterns within the form and as you say it might be for pulling the rug out under it may be for omitting something it might be for you know playing on the and two instead of the two that's what makes the music interesting and like understanding when to do that within the form like you can always tell kind of less advanced less sophisticated less nuanced rhythm section players that that try to just throw all these things at you and they're good things but they're at the wrong time you know that's kind of a misunderstanding of the form and, and where your placement in it is so important as a rhythm section player so our next example you're gonna like this a lot this I is like I, we talk about, I like the other ones this is all really good. <laughs> so our next example is from our course Brazilian rhythm section and oh, this is like this. <laughs> by the Brazilian rhythm section this is a group of amazing Brazilian musicians out of Sao Paulo and this is their fast samba lesson and I mean, you want to talk about crystal clarity, even at fast tempos. Check this out. Uh. This is fascinating rhythm, by the way, just so you can, so you know the tune. Let's try it again. Do it. Oh, 
How great is that? Mm. Setting up again using the arrangement yeah. to set up the form. They do that every time. Check it out at the end of this chorus as well. This just feels awesome too. Yeah. Simple groove, but man. Oh, right? right there. You know where you are. Yeah. yeah. Whew. You know where you are, but you, you don't mind the confirmation either, though. So you just <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like. <laughs> It's like Am I uh, at the right place? Yes, you are. Are yeah. you sure? Yes, you are. You ever go somewhere, like a beautiful place? On I don't go anywhere anymore. Oh, yeah. No. <laughs> no, but you ever go to like a beautiful place, like a beautiful place in nature, but you've been there several times, and you know you're going around that bend. And you, oh, here comes Lake Superior's coming That's up. That's right. I know it's coming. Yep. And even though you know it's coming, you still enjoy that view. Every time I go south across 44, I'm like, River de Pair. <laughs> River de Pair. It's coming. There it is. On the River banks de of de the Pair. majestic <laughs> River de Pair. Yes. Yeah. Isn't that awesome? It, <laughs> Wait, what are we talking about? No, the River. Samba. Oh, the Samba. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For yeah, sure. Yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I have another Samba feel okay. queued up, actually. This is from... Elio Alves is a brilliant course, uh, Brazilian jazz piano. And this is him and Edu Ribeiro and Bob Debu on the bass mm. and Romero Lubombo on guitar. Is Bob from Sao Paulo or from Brazil? He's uh, the only Brazil, one yeah. that, is not, <laughs> that does not speak Portuguese. But again, you can see very clearly here in the form just how how solid, especially Edu. Listen to how Edu marks every course. <laughs> First of all, just listen to Adu. Jeez. Hey, one note samba has more than one note. Let's talk about a little that. bit more <laughs> than one note. Hey, that was nice. Listen thing. to those subtle things Adu's doing though to like be like, here we are. Even at the end of Yeah, he hasn't left the high end yet. Just opening it up just yeah, at the end of the phrase. Yeah. It's just to be like ah, a little punctuation, you know? I mean, you want to talk about time field too, uh -huh. man. Elu Alves, holy smokes. Oof. Oh. Do here is revving it up, and Romero. You might not even hear it, but at the end of phrases, I know you know he does this. They'll be like, Whoa, yeah, yeah, <laughs> he'll yeah. just be like this little question, like, Yeah, what? Where? Yep. Yeah, yeah, it's, awesome. it's all part of the form, it's, it's awesome. all part of the form. So great. So that's from um, Brazilian jazz piano from Elio Alves, yeah, just an amazing. Amazing course uh, and amazing group of musicians who are masters at that. Yep. So we're gonna we're gonna do a couple more here. This is by someone who knows a little bit about this, and this is well, this would be this person's definition of a rhythm section. This is Christian McBride from his course. Your sound is your signature, hmm. and here they're gonna talk a little bit about. Uh, I think this is I thought about you. Carl, I was thinking we could. It's him and Carl Allen, by the way, not not any slouches on keeping no. time in the form. Demonstrate himself. a two field, because I feel like the, that two field that uh, that that really separates the pros from the amateurs. Agreed. <laughs> so they're going to demonstrate a two field here. What a great, what a great vibe. Here it is. Here's Christian McBride and Carl Allen. And again, uh, there's no soloist here, so they're just kind of demonstrating. But notice how they still, even though there's no one to respond to, they're marking the phrases of the melody where it would be. You can yeah. hear Christian actually singing the melody. And uh, listen to what Christian does, both melodically and rhythmically. Amazing stuff. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> mm. So even just that, sorry. So I just want to back it up. Listen to what he does here on this walk down, right? He's going to he's gonna 
Well, he's going to mark. Here's the last phrase of the A by doing this little walk down. It's so yeah. it's so obvious when they were showcasing the two feel because he can use his rhythm. Yeah. Watch this. Uh, you know what I mean? Use that. Use the use the and the place that he's ending up. You know, yeah. it's like. Man, the sound is unbelievable. I mean, Carl is marking every beat so clearly. Yeah. I guess we can stay there for a second. Yeah, let's let's stay there. Huh. Ooh, the little subtle things that Carl, because Chris is playing a lot, and he's really everything that's needed for the form. But ooh, setting it up. Where you Man. have to find those things, you know, to fit in with the form. Check it out, check it out. Ah, uh, Carl caught that so slick. I know, right? But this is what I'm saying, man. Coming, coming back to now, now we're definitely at art form level. Yeah. This is not craft. I mean, this right. is a lot of craft and years of right. of, build, of working on their craft. But these are two premier artists that are that are showing you how to keep time and how to set up a form with the two feel yeah and it is becoming that that idea of they're not setting up every four bar bar line robot right. One, or every two, phrase three, four. i mean it's literally a conversation about the form that's happening here like yes. they're they're posing questions to each other about the phrases right and answering each other it's that's when it gets like it just this is why people when they see live jazz they smile and their their heart skips a beat and they tap their foot yeah because you can have the conversations about the song during the song yeah it's amazing and I mean what what Carl's doing there um, is so brilliant because when you're having just like you say when you're having a conversation like when to step in like the easiest thing is to wait for the other person to finish then you say something and then they say something it's not the easiest thing but that's like you have to figure out when they're gonna be done but a rhythm section now maybe we're at the meat of it now the bass and the drums right but when they're having that that conversation together but being the support of the form and of the music and of the solace and everything it's like you have to be kind of talking at the same time mm. and so somebody needs to sort of be able to do interesting things and have that conversation without overtaking it. There's so many little subtle things. Oh, I could listen to that all day. I want you to. It's great. We're gonna start just from the beginning of this form one time, and I want you to listen to Carl's quarter note. And if by that, I have to. I, by that, I mean you can hear beats one, and he, and if if you see the video here from the chorus, you can see him like lift the brush way high. Yeah. Before beat one, and you know, like it's got, it's a clear beat one, it and is. then that hi hat is a clear beat two. Three is on the snare drum again. I mean, it, he's really playing all four beats, even on this two feel. Yeah. And you don't get a sense of this like overwhelming quarter note, but it's no. all there. Check it out. Oh. I mean, you can really feel the pulse with oh. every beat, you know? It's just so locked in already. Man. It's such a joy, actually, to watch these two, listen to these two do this, you know? He's gonna mark it. Uh, just little fills yeah. to set it up, you know. Carl caught every single <laughs> like he yeah. knew what he was gonna do. He yeah. caught the triplet on the on the end and then he caught the back end. Listen to that again, that fill going into the second end. Man. It's like he's reading his mind. I know. It's just amazing. Yeah. Well, and the, the whole thing about it, too, is like sometimes people get it twisted in that it's like, oh, if you're too locked in, then you're playing like a robot or you're playing automated or you have to you've you've backed yourself into a corner. But I really think with the great rhythm section players, it's the opposite. Like when you start out and you can get locked in. I mean, the reality is they're locked in like during the count off, basically. Yeah. But within the first few beats, now you've got the freedom 
to just let it flow. And it's not like Carl's like, oh, I have to catch everything. Even if he knows what he's going to play, it's like, what do you catch? What do you not? Like, how do you compliment? Just like in a conversation where if you're like, yeah, uh-huh, mm, boom, yeah, yeah. And then you're ready to jump in or pull back. And if they say something that's a little unexpected, that's fine. But you're not ever aping what the other person, like that's the kind of rhythm section that, that is not in service of the form because things get out of balance, I think. Like yeah. we could give an example. Like why don't you start talking to me and I'll give you an example of bad conversation. So, so as, as, at, but this weekend yeah, I was, just, and me and me, Nico, don't go, me, this is not, not fun. Not, this is not fun. See, because I, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like, I'm trying to, I think I know what you're going to say, so I'm going to say it with you. Yeah. But let's try that again. So this weekend, mm -hmm. Nico and I were learning a song on the piano that we could play together. Together. Yeah. See, that, that was yeah, more fun. That was good. See? Yeah. yeah. yeah we yeah. got we got a rapport here. Yeah. Man, we've been doing this podcast for minutes, we, see? <laughs> we know how to do many things at once. Okay. So I want to go out on one because we I know we have a lot of pianists that listen to this podcast, and, and uh, I want to sort of address how the piano itself can be, you know, it's the cliche is the piano can be the orchestra, right? But it could also yep. be the rhythm section. And... This is from Diane Reeves' course, uh, Define Your Voice, mm. which is just a beautiful course. Yeah. And uh, it's you and Diane, and uh, you're, you're going to play the tune, That's All, right? Mm. And so the, the point of this, this is, the lesson is called Making a Standard Your Own. So Diane's going to kind of demonstrate how she would do this sort of straight ahead in a kind of a typical way as a ballad, and then how she would do it uh, as sort of a, a different way that she would like to do it. And that's not really what I want to talk about, though. I want to okay. I want to kind of more listen to what you're doing because it, it's a chance to hear Peter do these two different time feels, and you set her up in different ways depending on the feel. And I want to. You probably weren't thinking about it again. You were just. This is just uh, innate at this point. But I want to just notice here. We're going to hear the same tune. We'll listen to it as a ballad, and then we'll hear that second version where it's a little more medium up. But here's that's all as a ballad. I can own give you love that lasts forever you know and a promise to be near each time you call well answers and the only Setting heart I, I own for you and you alone that's all that Okay. So even there, just with that, you just did that little half chorus, mm -hmm. right? But you can hear you answering her. You know, she's singing the melody just really straight down the middle. It's, mm -hmm. it's pretty basic. And well, I mean, she it's, it's Diane, so it's never basic, basic. <laughs> but you know what well, I mean. Basic is good with her. But no, it's it's yeah. yeah, basic is is amazing with her. So, but you can hear you again. We'll listen to it again. Listen to what Peter does between each phrase one more time. I can only give you love that lasts forever. Listen to what he does while she's singing and while she's singing. And not. a promise to be near each time you call. And the only heart I, I, I own for you and you even I just want to stop real quick but even in the middle of this phrase and the only heart I own you do a little thing after that between the last half of the sentence check it out and the only heart I, I own for you and you alone you know almost again answering her question even just in the middle of the phrase great well, and I think on this too I was at first I was like wait are we playing yeah it's, it's kind of in time like it, it's a real subtle implication of the the time, which I like to do when it's just a duet, duet like when you are the whole rhythm section, mm. because I, I never feel like, okay, we now we have to pretend like it's this like strict time with the trio, pretend like it's brushes. The whole beauty of it is that you can loosen that up, but still have the form laid out. If you have a lesser singer that doesn't know how to really nail the lyric and the melody, then you have to do a little bit more rigid type of playing. But when you've got that, yeah. you know, Diane Reeves singing, singing the melody like she really is actually handling the whole form because of the way the lyric and the melody is so that eases me up i could have even been playing a little bit more probably but maybe i did later so now diane's gonna mix it up here uh do it a little bit up tempo and listen now peter adjusts how he keeps the time and marks the form <laughs> Be bum, but I'm doing be dumb, be bum, 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 be bum,
There, you just did the same thing Christian did in the in the lesson before. Where you? Oh, he told me it was cool. I said, said cool. I said, can I borrow that bass line? He's like, yeah, no. Yeah, problem. listen to how uh, Peter totally rips Christian's bass. <laughs> Again, it's a conversation here. Have told you they would give you the world for a toy. All I have are these arms to enfold you and a love that time could never destroy huh. if you're one. So right there, that bass line, never destroy. And listen to how you just switch it up. That subtle thing you do with the eighth note dotted quarter note thing. De- if you're wondering you can just just commenting on the form you know? yeah so sometimes like those you hear she diane's is like she kind of loosens things like she's singing really ry- rhythmic before that yeah yeah and i mean i can't claim to actually have noticed this in real time but sometimes it works out of course where yeah. you can kind of cross over then and she kind of loosens it up and then i give her a little bit of stu- like i almost turn the syncopation around which is a little bit it's conversational but it's also in terms of the form like okay i got this yeah let's flip it over on its head so that when we come out to that last day Bam, we flip it back over. That's awesome. That's awesome. So let's. Had to know that my demands are small. Say it's me that you look Crystal clear. Door. For now and never more. It's like now that's she's sort of riding the wave over on top of the time. But you're giving her the confidence of having that very solid. First of all, your time is impeccable, of course. That's a given, right? But you're giving her by setting her up and net letting her know that you're not just. You're not just going to play through her breaks no matter what happens, right? Mm. So you you can hear that when she's singing, you're keeping things very simple and very much so that she has a nice warm blanket to sort of sing over. And then when she leaves you a bit of space, you answer her musical questions so she doesn't feel like she's just left out there with nothing, like she's just playing to, you know, I real be or something, yeah. right? Like that that's not how that works. Well, wait until it gets to the third chorus. I actually pull from underneath, I don't want to give it away, from underneath the piano, a electric heated blanket and hand it to her, <laughs> thus giving her, going from a proverbial here, warm blanket. <laughs> I've been warming this up, Diane. Now here's the actual warm blanket. <laughs> that's awesome. Listen to this a little bit more and uh, yeah. So just listen to this transition here between at the end of her her eight uh, eight bars here, you set up this two five going into the flat five chord, uh, the start of your solo, in a, a, with a little hit. And this is exactly kind of what I'm talking about here. It really kind of depends on where she's going to end her phrase, and I think you just nail it. This is such great communication. So that's that to me that that signifies everything we're talking about today that there's no such thing as form robots you want to be very clear with where things are but it really depends on what's going on and it's a conversation again hearing you and Diane hearing uh, Christian and Carl Allen have this conversation about the song while they're playing the song it's just really inspiring man and I, I, to me this is what separates rhythm sections I want to listen to from rhythm sections that just kind of sound okay Mm. you know yeah no i think it's i think the 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 art of rhythm section playing um that's kind of what you're talking about and it really does 
the foundation is that most important Java rhythm. Let's not lose sight of that because that's what enables then the subtlety. So when we talk about really nailing the form, understanding the form, it's almost like the most important job of the rhythm section player um, and the rhythm section in this case, you know, piano or piano, bass and drums, whatever, however we're looking at it is what they bring already before they start. You know what I mean? So it's like if everybody the, starting from the bass and the drums and we remember when we started this with just hutch just with the drums so like an understanding of the form i mean not just a like oh i know the tune no but i'm talking about a deep kind of understanding where like you could be thinking of something else you have that, to that, yep you know, where it's like nothing you you could be like ah look at me look at me ah! it doesn't matter he's he's just like right in there with that and then you build on that all the way up to the vocalist or the soloist or whatever like that foundation is just so solid and becomes so interesting and then some things to take note of some takeaways for me is when you have a foundation like that when the, when it's so solid and it's so ingrained that means you know where the melody is going to be and that means that you're listening to the soloist and you know exactly what what they're doing because you're with them in the moment and you can comment and respond and that's i think when accompanying really becomes an art form then you make choose choices of how to answer questions how to pose your own questions and how to make crystal clear to your audience and to the other musicians what's happening here like what you know it's just like your your annoying conversation example <laughs> that you know don't be that yeah. that player don't be that player that's just not in the conversation that doesn't have their head in the music be yeah. like hutch respect the music right you know keep no matter what if that means that it's just the melody I'm, it, like what I, what I want to kind of break away from is the idea that you're just going off of the real book chart and you're setting up every four bars or whatever yeah, yeah. it's much more organic than that it's much more of a conversation and that's that's i think the easiest way to think about it absolutely yeah don't be able to pose the question don't be a poser but be able to pose the questions. You know what I'm saying? I think we can end it on that note, everybody. <laughs> well, thanks so much for listening today. Yeah. Uh, if you like what you heard, go to openstudiojazz.com for more. All of these examples today were from our courses. I thought it'd be cool to kind of showcase what we got over there. We have so much good stuff. Yeah, and actually, this is kind of a good reason. So openstudiojazz.com, go there, and you can access all this. If you come in as a Piano Access Pass mm. member, no, as an All Access Pass member, actually, mm -hmm. You ha that's the whole reason because sometimes people are like, well, I just want the piano courses. No problem. We've got the piano access pass, every single piano course that you saw. That's right. But if you want to go next level and access the Diane Reese course, the Christian McBride courses, yeah. go with your all access pass because it, you know, there's so much we can learn from each other. There's so much horn players can learn with. Like if you learn how to be a great, what it takes to be a great rhythm section player, yeah. that's how you're going to be able to play with a great rhythm section. Absolutely. Once you get the opportunity, you understand it from their standpoint. Same thing if you're a pianist, so much to learn from Steve Wilson's saxophone course so that when you get a chance to play with a great saxophonist, yeah. you can start to know what you're doing. So, I learned more about how to play melodies by watching Diane Reese's course than almost any piano course we have. I mean, yeah. really, it's truly an amazing absolutely uh, resource so cool well we did it again adam we nailed it with both generosity genius and a sense of gratitude you know <laughs> they didn't think it was possible but we did it and humility <laughs> no 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 just g's no no h's were involved <laughs> thanks everybody uh until next time you'll hear it <laughs>